Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my presentation for IB Chemistry Topic 5, uh, Energetics Standard Level. As you work through this presentation, make sure you're taking notes, um, uh, you know, pause it and revisit and re rewind and go back over bits that you didn't understand. And um, try and make sure you're working along as I go through the calculations as well, because the calculations, I think, are where this topic uh, can really stump some people. OK, so uh, without further ado, let's get stuck into the meat of it. OK, so we're going to start off by looking at exothermic and endothermic reactions. Um, and when we talk about exothermic and endothermic reactions, we're talking about the energy uh, involved in a reaction. OK, so you'll probably know this from GCSE, um, but to remind you, exothermic reactions are reactions that release energy. So what that means is that energy is transferred from the chemical store of the reactants to the thermal energy store of the surroundings. Now, when we say chemical energy store, we're talking about the energy locked up in the uh, in the chemical bonds of the reactants. OK, so in this case, the reactants will have more energy stored in their chemical bonds than the products will. And that difference in energy, that's what gets released to the surroundings as thermal energy. Now, I say thermal energy. Usually, exothermic reactions do get hotter. Um, however, they can sometimes give out other forms of energy, such as light or electrical energy instead. Also worth pointing out that they get hotter without an external energy supply, because we, we've all seen cases of a reaction getting hotter because we're heating it with a Bunsen burner. That doesn't mean it's exothermic. It has to produce its own heat to count as exothermic. Um, these reactions are generally self-sustaining, meaning that they'll only stop when the reactants run out. Now, the, uh, on the other hand, we've got uh, endothermic reactions. So endothermic reactions are reactions that absorb energy. So in this case, energy is transferred from the thermal energy store of the surroundings to the chemical energy store of the products. Another way to say that is that the chemical bonds of the products have more energy than the chemical bonds of the reactants, and they've gained that energy by absorbing it from the surroundings, and that has the effect of cooling the surroundings down. So usually these reactions get cooler. The temperature goes down as they absorb that heat from the surroundings. However, it's not always heat that they absorb to drive the reaction. Sometimes it might be light. Photosynthesis is a good example of that. We all know that plants photosynthesize and that process is driven by light. So it's an endothermic reaction. Um, you may not have thought about it in these terms, but um, electrolysis that you might have met before where we break compounds down using uh, direct electric current, that is also an endothermic process, which is driven by the electrical energy that we're supplying. Um, so these reactions typically require an external energy source to keep them going, and they'll stop either when the energy supply is halted or they run out of reactants. Now, when we're talking about exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions, we can represent them with these diagrams, which we call reaction profiles. And a reaction profile, all it does is it shows the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products uh, on a little graph. Um, the y-axis of the graph is the energy. The x-axis is just something we call um, progress of the reaction. You might sometimes see it called reaction coordinate or something like that. But it's just trying to show um, that we're starting with reactants and we're changing them into products. And as we do that, the energy of the reactants and products changes. OK, so in an exothermic reaction, the reactants have more energy and the products have less energy. And the difference in height between those two, that difference is the energy that's released as heat. OK, so it's really important we understand exactly what's happening here. We're starting with reactants that have a lot of energy locked up inside their chemical bonds and we're producing products with only a small amount of energy locked up in their chemical bonds and so that difference in energy that's what gets released as thermal energy and that's what warms the reaction up it's worth reminding you 
that when we're talking about the energy locked up inside chemical bonds, we can't detect that. It doesn't produce anything immeasurable. So when we say that reactants have lots of energy, that doesn't mean they're hot. It means they've got this chemical energy locked up inside them that we can't detect, but it gets released by the exothermic reaction. So conversely, we have then with an endothermic reaction, the reactants have a small amount of energy and the products have a larger amount of energy. And so in order to get that extra energy, the endothermic reaction, the reactants have to absorb a load of energy. And this energy that gets absorbed, that's coming from the surroundings. And that's why the surroundings cool down, because their energy has been taken and transferred into the chemical energy of the products in a form that we can't easily measure. Now, before we can go any further with this energetics topic, we need to get really clear in our heads the difference between the terms temperature and heat energy. Now, they're very closely related, but they are not the same thing. And so we need to make sure we are using them in the right way. OK, so temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles in, uh, in, in, in an object, in a material, uh, whatever it is. OK, so, for example, if we look at a red hot nail, and a bucket of water, the red hot nail has a higher temperature than the bucket of water, nothing controversial there. So what that means is that the average particle in the red hot nail has more energy than the average particle in the bucket of cold water. Where this can get more confusing though, is the idea that the bucket of cold water, although its temperature is lower, overall it contains more heat energy. And that's because heat energy is the total kinetic energy of all of the particles. So even though each of the individual particles in this bucket of cold water doesn't have much energy, there are so many more particles in the bucket of water than there are in the nail that the total amount of energy adds up to a greater value. So when we're doing our calculations in energetics, we're going to use the temperature but we're also going to have to use the mass of the material we've got because multiplying the temperature and the mass together will help us then work out the total amount of energy rather than just the average amount of energy. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing on the next slide. OK, so as we just discussed, um, we can calculate heat energy um, by taking into account both the temperature change of a material and the mass of that material. And that's going to get us closer to looking at not just what the temperature was, but what the actual total amount of heat energy is. Now, we're going to use this equation. It's one that you've seen before if you've done GCSE. We're going to say the heat change of a substance is equal to its mass multiplied by the change in temperature. Make sure we're using degrees Celsius as our units here, multiplied by the specific heat capacity of that material. And we can express that in symbols as Q equals M multiplied by C multiplied by delta T. That delta, that triangle there, that's a delta. And whenever you see that, that's used to refer to a change. So delta T means the change in temperature. OK, now you'll be OK with the idea of mass and the idea of temperature change, but specific capacity is worth exploring a little bit more. So specific capacity is this thing here, C, specific heat capacity. Okay? And that is a property of all materials. All materials have their own different specific heat capacities. And in the case of water, the specific heat capacity is 4.18 kilojoules per Kelvin per kilogram. What that means is if I took one kilogram of water and I wanted to increase the temperature by one degree Celsius, one Kelvin, same thing, then that would take 4,180 joules of energy. We can also express it as 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. And actually it's 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. That's what we're going to use most of the time because we're generally going to work with grams rather than kilograms in the calculations that we do. Now, this is actually going to be a really, really useful number, this 4.18. We're going to use it again 
and again and again. Because when we're going to do some calculations later, we're going to make some assumptions that will really simplify the calculations for us. And it's all going to revolve around this specific capacity for water. So we're going to use this value for all reactions involving water or aqueous solutions. And most of the energetics calculations we do will be with water and will be with aqueous solutions. Okay. Now, when we do this, we're going to say that the mass in grams is the same as the volume of the solution in centimetres cubed. So, for example, if we had 250 centimetres cubed of solutions involved in our reaction, we would say the mass was 250 grams. Now, that's not entirely 100% accurate. You know, most solutions are slightly denser than water. And so the mass might be a little bit more, maybe 253 or 254 grams. But the thing is, the specific capacity of water, 4.18, is much, much higher than the specific capacity of nearly every other substance we'll ever work with. And so overwhelmingly, going on the using the amount of water is a valid assumption because it's it's its contribution to the energy change is so much greater um, than anything else that that we can largely ignore any other substances. Um, OK, so let's let's move on and have a look at one of these calculations in practice. OK, so this is the first of many calculations we're going to do. Um, and whenever you get calculations um, in an exam, it's a really good idea to annotate and underline and to highlight the question to make it really clear to yourself which values you're going to be using and what's being asked. So as I read this question, I'm not just going to leave it there. I'm going to, I'm going to unpack it as I go. So it says reacting 25 centimetres cubed of a solution of sulfuric acid with 15 centimetres cubed of a solution of sodium hydroxide causes the temperature to increase from 21, so uh, from 23 degrees Celsius to 31 degrees Celsius. Calculate the heat energy released in kilojoules. I always put a little star next to the thing that I'm being asked to calculate to really draw my attention to it. OK, so we've got to calculate the heat energy released in kilojoules. Now, the equation for calculating heat energy we just saw on the previous slide is Q equals M multiplied by C multiplied by delta T. Now, we said earlier that the mass is the volume of solution that we're using. So the question is, do we use this 25 or this 15? Well, we're mixing these two solutions together. So the 25 and the 15 will add up to give us a total volume of 40 centimetres cubed. So actually, we're going to use both those volumes. So for my M, I'm going to write 25, add 15. I'll then multiply that by the specific capacity. Because it's happening in a solution, we're going to assume it's 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. And then I'm going to multiply that by my temperature change, my delta T. Now my delta T, temperature change, is going to be 31 take away 23, because those are the two values that were quoted in the question. OK, so if I do that, you, you might want to skip out this step because I'm going to I'm going to go super slowly. So my 25 and 15, that bracket comes to 40. Um, my uh, multiply by 4.18. And then 31 take away 3 is 8. So this becomes 40 multiplied by 4.18 multiplied by 8. I really encourage you to do these calculations yourself on the calculator as we go. So you've got exactly the right numbers to work with. So we can do 40 multiplied by 4.18 multiplied by 8. And if we do that, we get 1,000. 337.6 joules, but the question is asking for kilojoules. So I'm going to divide by a thousand to convert that into kilojoules, and that's going to give me 1.3376 kilojoules. Um, 
Now, that level of accuracy, that's five significant figures of accuracy there, that is too much. Because if we look at the, um, the values in the question, we've only got two significant figures of accuracy there. So probably the best answer to give will be to go to two significant figures as well. So 1.3376 to two significant figures will be 1.3 kilojoules as my final answer. And I'm just going to write there two, two significant figures. So my accuracy is clear. Okay, first calculation done. Well done if you followed it so far. Okay, so time to meet a brand new word. Um, you won't admit this is GCSE, but you're going to meet it now. This word is enthalpy, which we give the symbol capital H. So enthalpy is a measure of the energy locked up inside chemicals. You can really think of enthalpy as being chemical energy. Now, we will be talking a lot about enthalpy as we go through the rest of this uh, course. So enthalpy, as I said, it's something like the chemical energy locked up inside chemicals. Now, for reasons that we don't need to go into, you can only measure changes in enthalpy, not enthalpy itself. So we're not normally going to use H on its own like that. We are typically going to be talking about enthalpy changes, delta H. So that triangle, remember, is delta. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about delta H, delta H of reaction, delta H of combustion, delta H of formation. These are all things that we're going to meet over the next few slides. So we talk about delta H rather than enthalpy itself. Now, um, substances with lower enthalpy are more stable than those with higher enthalpy. Okay, Enthalpy level diagrams show the changes in enthalpy over the course of a reaction. So we've kind of seen one of those already, but we're going to look at another couple on the next couple of slides. Enthalpy level diagrams. So these are diagrams showing the changes in enthalpy over the course of a reaction. These are very, very similar to the reaction profiles that you saw earlier. Now, these are probably more familiar, more similar to the ones you've seen at GCSE. So we've got, instead of energy written on the y-axis, we've got the um, enthalpy, H. And we've got, in, a, in the case of an exothermic reaction, we've got a high level of enthalpy for the reactants and a low level of enthalpy for the products. And the difference between them is the um, enthalpy change. Now, in this case, because the enthalpy has decreased, we have got a negative enthalpy change. So whenever we see a negative enthalpy change, that tells us that a reaction is exothermic. Similarly, if we look at um, an endothermic reaction, where the reactants have less energy, or enthalpy rather, and the products have more enthalpy, that increase in enthalpy, that is a positive change. So when an enthalpy of reaction has a positive value rather than a negative one, then we can say that it's an endothermic reaction. Okay. Now, these diagrams, as I said, they're actually a little bit more complex than what the IB really needs you to know. Um, you don't need to actually put the hump on this hump there. That hump there represents the activation energy, which we'll talk more about when we do the kinetics topic. And equally, this great big hump there from the, from the bottom to the very top, that's also the activation energy of that. And again, we don't need the, act the actual activation energy. All we need is much more simplified diagrams that I'm about to show you. So these are our simplified enthalpy level diagrams, and this is the level you need for the IB. You might be expected to draw one of these, for example, uh, sketch it quickly in an exam question. So this is an exothermic reaction where we've got our reactants uh, A with more uh, or higher enthalpy and our products B with lower enthalpy. So we've got this negative minus VE, negative enthalpy change. And um, so this is an exothermic reaction. Now, Sometimes they only have two things on these enthalpy level diagrams. Sometimes they get more complicated. So on this one, for example, we're showing that the reaction produces some intermediates with more energy or more enthalpy first, and then the intermediates become the products with less enthalpy. And we will look, particularly if you do the higher level um, energetics course as well, you will see some, some very complicated looking diagrams called Born Harbor cycles. Um, but they're all still going to follow this same principle of the higher up you are on the, on the um, uh, diagram, 
the higher your enthalpy and the lower down, the lower your enthalpy. Um, in some ways, these are less useful because they don't tell you about the activation energy. But at the same time, they are simpler and easier to understand. And on some of the bigger, more complex ones, you're going to appreciate that simplicity because if we showed the activation energy, they might get a bit confusing to look at. So now we know what enthalpy and enthalpy changes are. The next obvious question is, how do we calculate them? So we're going to look a lot at calculating what we call enthalpy changes of reactions. So this is just the enthalpy change when uh, when one mole of a reaction um, occurs under kind of uh, standard conditions and standard states you know, and, and things like that. OK, we'll talk more about those definitions later. We give this the symbol delta H R. See that little subscript R after the delta H? That means that it's an enthalpy change of reaction that we're talking about. Now we're going to calculate these in a very similar way to calculating heat change, but with just one little tweak. Um, so we're still going to do mass times specific heat capacity times the temperature change. The only thing we're going to do is put a minus at the beginning, because what that will do is that will turn um, that will turn us turn out a negative value for an exothermic reaction and a positive value for an endothermic one. So we're still, we're really doing Q equals MC delta T, but we're just sticking a, a minus in front of it. So enthalpy change equals, so enthalpy change is the negative of the mass multiplied by the temperature change multiplied by the specific heat capacity. Okay. Now, one other thing we do need to do is convert this to moles of reaction. Um, so if we think about our um, energy change calculation before, we just calculated a number of kilojoules. We are going to need to calculate a number of kilojoules per mole, mole to the minus one, that is per mole. Ooh, my pen's not behaving. Um, so per mole, that's what that means. Okay, so whatever value we get for the enthalpy change here, to turn it into delta HR, we'll need to divide by the number of moles of our reactants and we might need to adjust for the stoichiometry of the reaction as well and we'll work through some examples of how to do that so don't worry about that just yet and remember as we do this we're going to be using the specific capacity of water as the specific capacity for all of our things and the mass in grams we're going to take to be the total volume of the solutions that we're using okay so without further ado let's get stuck into our first proper hardcore example. Here is our first calculation. You need to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction for the reaction below in kilojoules per mole if reacting 20.4 grams of HCl raises the temperature of 650 centimeters cubed of a solution by 24.1 degrees Celsius. Now as I said before I strongly encourage you to annotate your questions so I'm going to put a little star next to delta HR because that's what I'm calculating. I'm going to underline the units I'm being asked to give, kilojoules per mole. I'm going to underline my 20.4 grams of HCl. I'm going to underline the volume of the solution we've got, 650 centimetres cubed. And finally, I'm going to underline the temperature rise, 24.1 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, before I just get stuck into the calculation, let's think about a strategy. It's not we, we, we can't think of a one size fits all strategy, but always before a calculation, just sit down, take a moment to compose yourself and have a little think. How am I going to go about this? So the first thing I'm going to do, try and do is calculate the heat change of the reaction. Then I need to convert that to a molar value by dividing by the number of moles. Remember when we see here where it says kilojoules per mole, that means the kilojoules of heat energy divided by the number of moles uh, in the question and we might need to um, we might need to adjust this to the equation as well so um, we've got to think about the stoichiometry of, of the reaction as well so let's get on with our first bit calculate the heat energy change so I'm going to say delta H equals minus M C delta T so that is minus. Now the mass I'm going to use is not the 20.4 grams of HCl because remember the mass we use in these calculations is always the volume 
of the solution in centimeters cubed. So in this case, 650 centimeters cubed multiplied by the specific capacity, which we always use as 4.18 for water, even though it's not strictly true, it's a fair assumption to make. And then we multiply by the temperature rise, which is 24.1 degrees Celsius. And if we do that, I am going to get, let me just plug it into my calculator. I strongly encourage you to do this as you go along as well. So I'm gonna go 650, we're doing minus 650, multiplied by 4.18, um, multiplied by 24.1. And if I do that, I get um, minus 65,000, uh, 479.7 uh, joules will be my answer at the moment. Okay, so I've done this first stuff. I've calculated my heat, my heat change. So next I need to convert it into a molar value. Now to find anything per mole, you need to divide by the number of moles of whichever substance we're talking about. So I need to find the number of moles of HCl because it tells me I've got 24 point, so 20.4 grams of HCl. So to do that, I'm going to do N, that means number of moles in brackets HCl. Look at the way I'm really clearly labeling my calculations. I don't want to see just a list of numbers written down as you're working because you lose track of them and then it makes it very hard uh, or, or uh, you very easily make mistakes and it makes it very hard for the examiners to find uh, the right answer as well. So we're going to say N of HCl is going to be the mass over the um, molar mass. So mass over mm. Oh, hold on, lost my m. So mass over molar mass. So the mass is 20.4 grams. The molar mass is going to be 1.01 .01 for hydrogen added to added to 35.45 for chlorine. And so if I do that, I'm going to get so 20.4 20.4 divided by um, 36.46. That's the molar mass of HCl. Um, so divided by 36.46, and that gives me. Zero point. Now it gives me a really long decimal. I'm going to go to four significant figures. That's enough accuracy to, 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 to not lose anything. Um, so 0 0.5595 moles. Okay. So that's that step done. I've done. I, um, no, it's not. Sorry. I've um, calculated the number of moles. I need to convert this to a molar value. So um, I can say now that the enthalpy change of reaction. Uh, equals um, minus six foot 65,479.7 divided by my number of moles which is 0 0.5595 and if I do that that is going to give me just let me plug it in so uh, six five four seven nine point seven make it minus uh, divided by 0 0.5595 and if I do that I get minus 117033 joules per mole but I need to convert it to kilojoules per mole. I'm also going to put it to an appropriate number of significant figures, which in this case would be three. So I'm going to make that minus 117 kilojoules per mole. Okay, And that's going to be my final answer, because this last step here about adjusting it for the equation, because there's only one HCl involved in the equation, I don't need to do any adjustments. So that minus 117 kilojoules per mole is my final answer. Well done if you followed that. Example two, calculate delta HR. I'm going to put a little star next to that. Calculate delta HR for the reaction below in kilojoules per mole. If reacting 6.4 grams of KOH, 
raises the temperature of 250 centimeters cubed of a solution by 37.8 degrees Celsius. Now this is very similar to the last one with one important difference. The equation for the last one only had one HCl in it. Now this equation has two potassium hydroxides. So this bottom step down here, this bottom step down here on the um, on our little uh, uh, strategy, that bottom step is going to be important this time. So what we're going to need to do is do the same thing, calculate the heat change, convert it to a molar value, but then whatever answer we get, we're going to need to double it because we should have two moles in the um, in the uh, final uh, equation, right? So let's get our heat change done first. So we're going to say delta H equals minus M multiplied by C multiplied by delta T. Okay. Now my mass is 250 because we use the volume of the solution in centimeters cubed. So minus 250 multiplied by the specific heat capacity, which is 4.18, multiplied by the temperature change, which is 37.8. And if we do that, we get um, 250 multiplied by 4.18, multiplied by 37.8. If we do that, we get 39,501 joules. Now, I am going to simplify that to, uh, so convert that rather to kilojoules. So we're going to say, um, and I'm going to make it into four significant figures as well, because four significant figures is plenty accuracy if we're rounding to three in the end. So I'm going to say this is 39.5 kilojoules. OK, so that's the amount of that's the enthalpy change in this particular reaction. So what we need to do now is convert this to a molar value. So so we can say how much energy is or, or, or what the energy change is per mole of the overall reaction. So to convert to a molar value, we need to divide by moles because we're going for kilojoules per mole. That per mole means divided by moles. So we need to know the number of moles of potassium mineral dioxide. So we're going to do N of um, KOH equals mass little m over molar mass capital M with a subscript m and that equals um, 6.4 for the mass of potassium hydroxide we used. I need to calculate the molar mass so the from the data booklet if you look at um, table 6 with the periodic table on it um, we're going to have 39.10 over potassium plus 16.0 over oxygen and 1.01 for hydrogen so that becomes 6.4 over uh, 56.11 so if we do that 6.4 divided by 56.11 we get a fairly long decimal. I'm not going to write the whole decimal. I'm just going to do four significant figures because my final answer will be to three significant figures. So 0 0.1141 moles of KOH. So to convert my enthalpy change here to a molar value, I'm just going to divide by that number of moles. So the delta H uh, is going to be um, 39.5 kilojoules divided by the 0 0.1141 moles and if I do that 39.5 divided by 0 0.1141 what I get is 346.2 kilojoules per mole and I'm going to write at the end of KOH because it's not per mole of the overall reaction it's per mole of KOH so I've calculated the heat change I've done my molar conversion now I need to adjust it to the equation this bit here now to do that we've just got to think logically right so what I'm saying now is I'm releasing 346.2 kilojoules per mole of KOH but if we look at the equation there are two moles of KOH involved in the equation so for one mole of the overall reaction, I am going to double this value to double it from one KOH to two KOH. So I can finally say delta H um, R 
is going to equal um, 346.2 multiplied by 2 uh, and that is going to give me um, 692.37 but because of the accuracy of the numbers I'm using up here I'm going to round it to three significant figures so I'm going to go I'm going to say 692 kilojoules per mole as my final answer okay example three calculate the expected temperature change so I'm going to put my star there by the expected temperature change for the reaction below for which delta HR is minus 103.9 kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to underline that because that's important uh, information. Uh, if it takes place in an aqueous solution with a volume of 1000 centimetres cubed and 6.01 grams of HCl are present. Now, as you probably spotted, we're already given delta HR in this uh, question and we're going to have to work backwards to see what the expected temperature change would be. So we're still going to use our same strategy, but really we're going to be kind of working backwards. So we're going to adjust the equation, we're going to convert from a molar value, and then we're going to use that to calculate what the temperature change would be. So we're doing all the kind of same kind of steps as before, but we're working backwards. Okay. So our first step really then is going to be to use this mass of HCl to work out our number of moles of HCl so that we can work out the number of moles of the equation that happen and again if we look at that value there so uh, the equation we can see that we've got two HCl's this time so we are going to have to think about the stoichiometry of the equation as well so let's start first of all by working out the number of moles of HCl so the number of moles of HCl n of HCl uh, equals mass over the molar mass m over mm um, so that's 6.01 and the uh, molar mass for HCl is uh, 35.45 for chlorine added to 1.01 for hydrogen so this is 6.01 over 36.46 and that gives us, let me type it in my calculator, 6.01 divided by 36.46. And if I do that, I get to four significant figures, 0 0.1648. And four significant figures of accuracy is fine because I'm going to be rounding my final answer to three. It's a waste of your time writing out the full decimal that the calculator shows because it takes a long time to write and a long time to type and it's just surplus to requirements. So this is the number of moles of HCl that we uh, produce, uh, so that, we, that we're given in the reaction. So we need to use that to work out the number of moles of reaction. I'm going to put number of moles of reaction. I'm going to put a little RxN as shorthand for reaction. So the number of moles of reaction is going to be the number of moles of HCl divided by two and the reason why we're dividing by two is because the reaction requires two moles of HCl so for every mole of HCl the overall number of moles of the reaction will be half of that so this will be um, 0 0.1648 uh, divided by two and if we do that we're going to get 0 0.0824 moles of the overall reaction now the reason we're doing this is because this uh, this this minus 103.9 figure up here tells me the enthalpy change for one whole mole of the reaction. So if we now know the number of moles of the reaction that have actually taken place, um, we can work out the actual amount of uh, enthalpy change in this specific reaction rather than just for one whole mole of the reaction. So the delta H is going to be the delta H R for the for one whole mole of the reaction that's the quoted figure multiplied by the number of moles of reaction that happen um, which is what we just worked out so that n of the reaction n r x n so we're going to have our delta H R was uh, minus 103.9 and we're going to multiply that by our 0 0.0824 figure that we just worked out and if we do that we are going to get just let me plug it in 
minus um, multiplied by 0 0.0824 and if we do that we get um, minus 8.561 kilojoules okay so that's the amount of energy that is released in this reaction and the last thing we need to do now is to figure out well what will the temperature change be so here we're going to have to use our our um, q equals mc delta t kind of thing but we're going to rearrange it so if you remember the, the the calculations we were doing before we were saying delta h equals minus m times c times delta t we need to rearrange this to make delta t the subject so we're going to say delta t our temperature change is going to be um, minus uh, delta h over um, m times c so our delta h we've got it in kilojoules here we're going to turn that into joules so and it's going to be minus that so we're just going to make it minus minus 8.561 kilojoules turned into joules will be 8561 joules divided by our mass of solution the mass of solution is up here that is 1000 uh, grams because we use the volume so 1000 multiplied by specific capacity which is 4.18 okay so this is going to be um, 8561 divided by 4180 so let me just type that in so 8561 divided by 4180 and that is going to give me uh, to three significant figures 2.05 degrees celsius so by working through all this we've we found out that in this particular setup our 6.1 grams of hcl assuming everything else is present in excess would lead to a 2.05 degree temperature rise in this reaction again well done if you followed that now you've just seen us doing a, a few calculations um, using experimental data to determine enthalpy changes of reaction and the um, the obvious question that begs is well where does that experimental data come from and it comes from a technique we called calorimetry now if we look at this word calorimetry there are kind of two parts to it the metry bit that just means measuring okay and this bit calorie well it sounds like the word calorie we sometimes use when talking about food doesn't it calorie is really anything to do with energy so this is just um, this word calorimetry really just means energy measuring and you uh, you you would have done things like this uh, at GCSE and um, certainly if you're in my classes we've done them in lesson as well so uh, in calorimetry what we do is we very carefully measure the amount of uh, heat absorbed or released by a reaction and we measure it very straightforwardly with a thermometer and we have um, uh, setups in which normally um, the uh, the chemical reaction is being used to heat some water and the temperature change of that water is very carefully measured and then we use the whole um, delta h equals minus mc uh, delta t to work out the enthalpy change of that reaction now because we're measuring heat changes and heat has a tendency of dissipating and spreading out um, we design our experiments very carefully to try and make sure that we capture as much of the heat as possible so the kind of calorimeter that we might use uh, in a lab might look something like this here we can see we've got um, two nested polystyrene beakers one inside the other just to keep it really well insulated and we put a lid on there as well to reduce heat loss by convection and we're really trying in that setup to capture as much of the heat as possible and to prevent as much as possible from um, being transferred to the surroundings where we can't measure it now you can see down here a slightly different looking setup that we might use to say measure um, the enthalpy change when we're burning a fuel but we've got the same kind of thing you know insulated container we've got all this sealant everywhere to to reduce the chance of heat loss and again we're trying to transfer the heat from that reaction into water where we can measure it really uh, accurately and and the most kind of sophisticated setup you might see uh, you probably wouldn't have access to something like this one at school uh, this one's called a bomb calorimeter 
And the key thing with this is that the entire reaction vessel is surrounded by water. And so that really means that just about every joule of heat that gets released by the reaction um, will be collected and will heat the water and will be measured. So that's that's a really accurate piece of equipment. Um, and on that note of accuracy, if we are being really accurate, we often need to think about the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself as well. So, you know, we're not just going to measure the temperature of the water um, and do calculations based just on that, but the calorimeter itself will also heat up. And so we need to consider its heat change uh, based on its own heat capacity as well. And so you might see uh, calculations uh, like that in an exam. Hess's law. Hess's law is, I think, where the real meat of this um, of, of, of this topic starts. Now, Hess's law very simply states this. It says that the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the pathway of, of that reaction. So uh, we can we can paraphrase that as saying all that matters is the start and the finish points of the reaction. Now, really, what Hess's law gives us is um, it broadens our range of options we've got in terms of measuring the enthalpy change of a particular reaction. We'll, we'll look in, in a couple of slides time at why that might be useful. But we've got some examples of what this might look like in practice. So let's imagine we had this uh, equation here where we've got A and B reacting together to make C and D. And delta H1 is the enthalpy change that we're trying to measure. Now, you know, let's imagine for some reason we can't experimentally measure that one directly. But let's say there were a couple of alternative reactions where we could measure their enthalpy changes. So let's imagine A and B turn into E and F, and that has an enthalpy change of delta H2. And let's imagine also that E and F themselves, then they turn into C and D with an enthalpy change of delta H3. What Hess's law says is that delta H1, the one we're interested in, would can be calculated by adding delta H2 and delta H3 together. So if we could measure delta H2 and delta H3, we could use it to find delta H1. Let's look at a second example. It doesn't just have to be two steps, it could be three steps. So again, let's imagine we've got A and B turning into C and D, and we want to measure delta H1, but for some reason we can't. We could have some different reactions that are all kind of linked together. So maybe A and B can make E and F and that produces delta H2. Let's imagine E and F can be produced from G and H, and that um, gives us delta H3. And then let's imagine also that G and H in different conditions could turn into C and D, and that produced delta H4. Well, we could string all of that together to say that the enthalpy change delta H1 would be equal to delta H2 minus delta H3 add delta H4. Now why this minus? That minus is because with delta H3 we're going against the arrow. So when we do these kind of calculations, when we go with an arrow we'll add and when we go against an arrow we'll take away a little bit like when you do vectors in maths. Now why must this be the case? This must be the case because of conservation of energy which is what we're going to look at on the next slide. So conservation of energy and Hess's law. What do these things have to do with each other? Well, remember what Hess's law says is that the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the pathway of that reaction. And our little paraphrase was that all that matters is the start point and the finish point. Well, why must that be the case? If we look at an enthalpy level diagram, we can see why it must be the case. So imagine we've got the reactants here and the products up here, okay? And the enthalpy change of this reaction is just the difference in the enthalpy of the products and of the reactants. Now those two quantities are fixed, they're not changed by, 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 by any other factors surrounding the reaction. So given they're fixed, if we imagine that there were some different other reactions we could do to get to the products via a different pathway, let's imagine the reactants can turn into intermediate A and intermediate B and so on. And we can, we, we can add those things onto the uh, enthalpy level diagram, these intermediates, A and B, they don't affect the overall height or, or the, the, the overall position of the products and the reactants on our enthalpy level diagram. And so all we need to do to find delta HR that we're looking for is we're going to add delta H1 going with the arrow, subtract delta H2 because we're going against the arrow, subtract delta H3 
because we're going against the arrow and that will give us our enthalpy change and it comes down to conservation of energy because if this different pathway produced a different enthalpy change for the reaction it would mean that somehow we either gained or lost energy and that simply can't happen so Hess's law arises out of just the simple fact that energy is always conserved and we can see that on the uh, reaction profile here by the way that these these different pathways going by intermediate A and intermediate B doesn't affect the overall enthalpy level of the reactants and products. So it's not going to change the overall, uh, affect the overall enthalpy change. So why is Hess's law useful? Um, it's useful for one big reason, which is that it's not always possible to directly measure the enthalpy change we want. And there are several reasons for that. It may be that a reaction is an endothermic reaction that needs a constant heat supply. Um, for example, it might be something, a reaction that only happens whilst we're heating it with a Bunsen burner. And in that situation, a, uh, the heat change is very difficult to measure because the temperature will change for sure. But how do you know which part of the temperature change is coming from the reaction and which part of it is coming from the heat supplied by the Bunsen burner? Um, sometimes a reaction doesn't stop where you want it to. Um, it might be that the products you make are themselves unstable and straight away react to produce something else. And so you've got no way of, of, of measuring your, your take your temperature measurements at the exact spot you want because the reaction just continues straight on to another destination. Um, and it might, may sometimes be that the reaction is just too slow. If a reaction is really slow, it doesn't lend itself well to calorimetry because although in calorimetry we, we really try to trap as much of the heat as possible, if a reaction is slow, and by that I mean maybe, you know, maybe it takes a week to happen, the energy will just leak away even with the best insulated containers because you know, there is a limit to how effectively we can, we can trap that heat. So what Hess cycles allow us to do is measure these enthalpy changes indirectly uh, in situations where there are kind of practical experimental reasons why we can't measure them directly. Standard enthalpy change of formation, uh, delta HF. Now, this is a really important piece of thermodynamic data that we're going to use really uh, regularly to help us calculate um, enthalpy changes using the ideas of Hess's law. OK, so the standard enthalpy change of formation is this thing here. It is the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is formed from elements in their standard states okay so for example if we were looking at ethanol the delta hf the enthalpy change of formation for ethanol is minus 278 kilojoules per mole so what we're saying is really it's the enthalpy change for this reaction for two carbons and three hydrogens and half an oxygen molecule reacting together to make one ethanol Okay. Now, if we just note a couple of little things here, note, first of all, that we've got solid for carbon gas for um, so H2 gas and O2 gas. These are the standard states of the three elements that ethanol is made from. Right. And so the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of this overall reaction takes place. And so for ethanol, that's minus 278 kilojoules per mole. Now you'll see on the right here, we've got a whole load of other enthalpy changes of formation. And you can see they vary from, from, from uh, really, for the most part, for most of the compounds we meet, between about plus and minus 300 kilojoules per mole uh, or thereabouts, right? Now this, uh, this incidentally, this is table 12 in your data booklets um, and it's really important that you you get familiar with that data and get 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 uh, used to looking for information on there and using it right now um standard enthalpy changes of formation are often difficult to measure directly so they have to be measured indirectly and really importantly is this thing at the bottom here the delta hf of elements in their standard states is zero okay now, this trips people up every year, but it does make sense because the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is formed from their elements in their standard states. So if something is already an element in its standard state, then it stands to reason that the enthalpy change of formation must be zero. OK, so let's look in the next few slides at how we can actually apply this to doing some calculations. Example one. 
use standard enthalpy changes of formation to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction for the reaction below. So I'm going to put a little star next to enthalpy change of reaction to remind me that's what I'm trying to find out. That is this value here. And the um, reaction is this. It's the hydrogenation of ethene. So we're going to have ethene added to hydrogen is going to make ethane. Um, gas, gas and gas are our three um, state symbols. Now, to do this, we're going to draw, do what's called a Hess cycle. Um, those are those diagrams you saw earlier where we were um, when we first introduced Hess's law. So if we look at our strategy, first of all, we're going to ensure the equation balances. And most of the times the ones are given will, but do just check. Ensure it balances. Um, write the elements um, beneath the equation. Add arrows connecting the elements uh, to each side of the equation. Find delta H for each side by adding the delta HF from the data booklets and then calculate delta HR by subtracting, going against the arrows and adding as we go with the arrows. So let's see what that looks like in practice. Our first step then is to ensure the equation balances. C2H4 add H2, that's two carbons and six hydrogens. And on the right, two carbons and six hydrogens. So yes, it does balance. We're going to tick off that first step. Write the elements beneath. So what I mean is this. So on the left, we've got two carbons. So I'm going to put two C in brackets S added to um, six hydrogens, um, four from ethene and two from the hydrogen. But because these are elements in their standard states, the standard state of hydrogen is H2 gas. So I'm going to have three H2s, G, down at the bottom. OK, so that is my elements. And those are the same elements that would be needed to make the products as well. And if your equation balances, then that should always be the case. So tick off that second step. I've written my elements beneath. Now I'm going to add arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation. So really what I'm saying is if I react my carbons and hydrogens in one fashion, I will get ethene and hydrogen. And if I react them in another fashion, I would get ethane. OK, so that's that step done. I've, I've, I've added my arrows. OK, now how do we know which direction the arrows go? Well, Enthalpy changes of formation involve turning the elements into the other substances. So our, our arrows are going to go from the elements to those other substances. So now we need to find the delta H for each of those new reactions. And I'm going to do that by adding up the enthalpy changes of formation from the data booklet. So this first one on the left, I'm going to call it delta H1. Okay. So delta H1, that is going to be the enthalpy change of formation for ethene. So I'm going to write it like this, enthalpy change, delta HF. Note that little symbol there that looks like a London Underground sign. That just means standard condition. So I'm going to say delta HF of C2H4. Now, I'm not going to do anything with the hydrogen because the hydrogen is an element in its standard state. So it's delta HF by definition is zero. So we can we can ignore that for now. OK, so in this case, I'm just going to use my data booklet to find the answer. So the enthalpy change information for uh, ethene C2H4 from the data booklet um, is plus 52 kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to put plus 52 there, 52.0. OK, right. And so then on the left hand side, uh, right hand side, rather, uh, delta H2, this side is just going to be the enthalpy change of formation, delta HF4. Ethene, uh, ethane rather, C2H6. Um, and again, if I check my data booklet, table 12, enthalpy change information for ethane is the second one down, and that is minus 84.0 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So now I've got all I need to calculate the enthalpy change of the reaction. So delta HR is going to be equal to minus delta H1. Because I'm going against this arrow here, I'm going the opposite direction. So when you go against the arrow, you do the negative of that. And then it will be plus delta H2 because I'm going with that arrow. So minus delta H1 um, plus delta H2. So that is going to be minus 52.0 plus minus 84. Okay, 0.0. And that would give me um, minus 136 kilojoules 
per mole as my final answer. Okay, so I've done those last two steps. I've added the delta H to each side, and then I've calculated delta HR by subtracting as I go against the arrow, and then adding as I go with the arrow to give me minus 136 kilojoules per mole. Example two, use standard enthalpy changes of formation to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction for the reaction below. Um, so I'm going to put a little star next to my delta HR because that's what I'm trying to find out. Now this, um, this one's going to be a bit more complicated than the last one for a couple of reasons. Um, if we look over at the product side, there are two uh, extra bits of complexity happening here. First of all, we've got two compounds, uh, that one and that one. So they will both need to take into account um, when we calculate delta H2, but also we've got two HCLs on the right. So we're going to need to think about that as well when we do our delta H2 calculation. So we're going to follow the same method, but we're just going to do a little bit more to get that delta H2. So first thing is ensure it balances, and there are, there's one carbon on the left, one on the right, four hydrogens on the left, four on the right, and four chlorines on the left, four on the right. So yes, it does balance. So then what we're going to do is write the elements beneath. I'm going to actually write them quite a long way further down to give myself a bit more space this time, because my calculation is going to be um, a bit more involved. So I'm going to say two carbon in brackets s um, add two h2 in brackets g add um, two cl2 in brackets g so that's that step done next step is to add arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation remember the arrows are going up because these are enthalpy changes of formation so i am turning the elements into um the products and the reactants. So delta H1, nice and easy. Delta H1 on the left is just going to be the enthalpy change of formation for CH4, which is methane. So that is just going to be, um, if I look on table 12, enthalpy change of formation for methane is minus 74.0 uh, kilojoules per mole. Um, that's that one done. Easy peasy. Um, delta H2, a bit more involved here. What we're going to do is we're going to say delta H2 is going to be the enthalpy change of formation for CH2, Cl2, plus two lots of the enthalpy change of formation for HCl, because there are two HCls in the equation. So this is going to be uh, for the um, CH2, Cl2, that's dichloromethane, so if I look on table 12, I can find that the enthalpy change information for dichloromethane is minus 124 kilojoules per mole. And then I'm going to add that to two lots of the enthalpy change of formation for HCl. Now the enthalpy change information for HCl, again, looking at table 12, is minus 92.3. So this will be two times minus 92.3. So let's just put a decimal point. So if I work that out on my calculator, I am going to do uh, 124 minus plus 2 times 92.3 minus, and that's going to be minus 308.6 kilojoules. Okay, so now I can calculate my delta HR. So delta HR is going to be and because i'm going against the arrow that's going to be minus delta h1 and because i'm going with the second arrow it'll be plus delta h2 so that will be minus minus 74 plus minus 308.6 and if i stick that into the calculator so uh, 70 minus minus 74 is just 74 and we are going to take 308.6 away from that and that will give me minus 234.6 kilojoules per mole bish bash bosh so to talk us through what we've done we ensure the equation balance we wrote the elements beneath we added the arrows going from the elements to the reactants and products then we found our delta HRs from the data booklets. And the important thing was we multiplied the hydrochloric acid one by two because there are two HCLs in the equation. And then we calculated delta HR by going against 
the first arrow, so minus delta H1 with the first arrow plus delta H2. Example 3, um, use standard enthalpy changes of formation to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction for the reaction below. So put a little star next to delta HR because that's what I'm finding. So we have um, C6H14, that's hexane, making, th uh, there's my hexane, making three ethene, C2H4, and some hydrogen. So start, as always, by making sure the equation balances. Um, C6, six carbons, three lots of uh, C2, that's six carbons. Um, H14, 14 hydrogens, three times four is 12, plus another two makes 14 hydrogens on the right. So yes, it does balance. So then we write those elements below. We're gonna have um, six carbons, and they're gonna be solid. That's the uh, standard state for carbon. Um, and we're gonna have seven H2s. That will give us our 14 hydrogens. Remember, H2G is the standard state for that. And then um, we're going to add the arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation. And remember, our arrows are going upwards because we're using enthalpy changes of formation. So forming these things means turning the elements into the substances. OK, so starting on the left, delta H1 is going to just simply be the standard enthalpy change of formation for C6H14, which can be found in the data booklet, um, pay table 12. So hexane, enthalpy change of formation, minus 199 kilojoules per mole. So minus 199. Um, and then um, uh, delta H2 is going to be um, three lots of the standard enthalpy change of formation for ethene C2H4 because there are three ethenes in the equation. Now remember, we do not need to do anything with the H2 because hydrogen gas is an element in its standard state. So this enthalpy change of formation is zero, which means we can ignore it. So this will be three multiplied by the enthalpy change of formation for ethene, which again from the data booklet is plus 52. So three times 52.0 which is going to come to 156. So that's my delta H1 and my delta H2. So um, we've stuck the data in. So now we're going to do our calculation by subtracting as we go against arrows and adding as we go with. So this means delta HR is going to be minus delta H1 because we're going against the arrow. So minus delta H1 um, plus delta H2 because we're going with the arrow. So that's going to be minus minus 199, i.e. plus 199. Take away, I mean add rather, add um, 156. And if we do that, that's going to give us 355 kilojoules per mole as my final answer. So the main thing to remember from this slide is that whenever we see um, a coefficient in front of one of our substances, we've got to multiply our enthalpy changes of formation. And when we see an element in its standard state, we ignore it because its enthalpy change of formation is zero. So now we're going to look at standard enthalpy change of combustion. And this is really similar to what we were talking about with formation, but rather than the enthalpy change when we form a substance, it's the enthalpy change when we combust a substance. So we give it a little delta H with a C uh, to represent combustion. Remember, combustion is just burning things in oxygen. OK, now um, this is then the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is fully combusted under standard conditions. What does standard conditions mean? Standard conditions means a temperature of 298 Kelvin. That's 25 degrees Celsius, which is roughly room temperature in most places around the world. And the um, pressure would be 100 kilopascals, which is one atmospheric pressure. That's the, the pressure more or less outside right now. OK, um, so an example of this might be the enthalpy change of combustion for ethanol. Um, so the delta HC for ethanol is minus 1,367 kilojoules per mole. Uh, minus then means it's exothermic. And so that means that this reaction here 
with one ethanol reacting with three oxygen gases to make two carbon oxides and three waters. That releases uh, 1,367 kilojoules uh, for each mole of ethanol that you burn. OK, um, now there's a few things that are worth bearing in mind about this. Firstly, our, our rule about the enthalpy change of formation for uh, elements being zero, that doesn't apply to uh, enthalpy changes of combustion because many of the elements themselves can burn. So if we look right at the top of our, our table here, um, hydrogen, it has an enthalpy change of combustion of minus 286 kilojoules per mole because hydrogen burns very very well and um, as do many other elements so we do need to think about elements and when we do these calculations it's also worth bearing in mind that some things don't have an enthalpy change of combustion so for example water famously doesn't burn so it doesn't have an enthalpy change of combustion carbon dioxide a product made by combusting other things so it also does not burn so we we we, we don't have enthalpy changes of combustion for many things, um, uh, water and carbon dioxide being uh, two of the most important ones. Um, one last thing that's worth bearing in mind, because I haven't mentioned it yet, is just this symbol here, that London Underground symbol. That means the standard conditions down here. So whenever you see that symbol, we're talking about 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals of pressure. So let's look at how we can use enthalpy changes of combustion to um, do a Hess's law kind of calculation. So example one, use standard enthalpy changes of combustion to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction below, um, which is this one. Now this is the same reaction that we did, for example, one with enthalpy changes of formation. So I've done that so you can see how the two different values uh, might compare to each other. Now, um, the data we're going to use can be found on table 13 of the periodic table. So if you've got that with you now, uh, to open it up and have a look at what the different values are. Now, our method is going to be very, very similar. We're going to ensure the equation balances. We're going to write the combustion products beneath rather than the um, rather than the elements this time. We're going to add arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation. We're going to find the delta H for each side by using information from the data booklet. And then we're going to calculate delta HR by subtracting as we go against arrows and adding as we go with arrows. Now, let's do that first bit. Make sure the equation balances. Two carbons on the left, two on the right, six hydrogens on the left and six on the right. So the first um, uh, step is done. Now, it says write the combustion products beneath. So what do I mean by that? Well, what do we get whenever we burn a hydrocarbon fuel? Um, for example, ethene here, we get carbon dioxide, CO2, and we get water H2O. OK, um, now how many of each do we produce? Well, we've got two carbons in our ethene, so that's going to be two carbon dioxides. And burning our ethene, it has four hydrogens as well, which would lead to two waters being formed. But don't forget, we've also got these two over here. So that would be three waters on the uh, 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 being formed as well. Now, would the left give us that as well? Well, yes, it would, because we've got two carbons in our ethane um, product and we've got six hydrogens. So again, those would make uh, two carbon dioxides and six waters. OK, now we could add oxygen to each side of the equation, but we don't really need to because it's only going to complicate the visual look of it. Um, and these no, these are just a tool to help us with our understanding. So it doesn't matter if they're not 100% perfect. Now we, we, we've done this step, then we've written the combustion products in. We need to add arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation. Now, which way do the arrows go? Well, with enthalpy changes of combustion, we're burning things to make the carbon dioxide and water. So this time, our arrows are going to point downwards like this. OK because the ethane so the ethene and hydrogen are making these products down here the ethane is making those products down there so that's why the arrows have to go that way so now we're going to use our data from the data booklets to figure out delta h1 and delta h2 so what will that look like well delta h1 is going to be the enthalpy change of combustion for ethene c2h4 added to the enthalpy change of combustion for H2. Now remember, we can't ignore the elements these, this time because hydrogen does burn, so it does have an enthalpy change of combustion. So 
if we look at the values, so for ethene, C2H4, our enthalpy change of combustion is, um, just bear with me, can't find my rumor table properly, C2H4, our enthalpy change of combustion is minus 1,411. So we've got minus 1,411. And for hydrogen, it's minus 286. Minus 286. So if we add those up, we're going to get a, a delta H1 of minus 1,697 kilojoules per mole. And what about on the right? The right is a bit simpler because we've only got one substance on the right. So delta H2 is just going to be the enthalpy change of combustion for um, ethane, C2H6. And if I research that on the table 13, um, so ethane gives us a value of minus 1,561, minus 1,561 kilojoules per mole. And if I, uh, so, so I've done that step. So the last thing is to calculate my delta HR. So I'm going to subtract going against the arrow and add going with the arrows. So delta HR is going to be, now I'm going with the first arrow. So it's just going to be delta H1. And I'm going against the second arrow. So it's going to be take away delta H2. And what that gives me is minus 1697 take away minus 1561 and that gives me um, let's, let me type it in 1697 minus take away 1561 minus and that gives me a value of minus 136 kilojoules per mole just like that okay so i think the key thing to get right here is just to make sure your arrows are pointing in the right direction and to ask yourself uh, or, or to, to, to work out which way the arrows go you just got to ask yourself what does enthalpy change of combustion represent it represents these things turning into these things so the arrows have to point downwards and if you do that I think the rest of the calculation is fairly straightforward now, I did mention that this uh, calculation that we just did is the same example one as we used with the enthalpy changes of formation. And let's have a look at the answers we got. So um, we just found using enthalpy changes of combustion that the enthalpy change here was minus 136. And when we did it with enthalpy changes of formation, it was also minus 136. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise because this really gets to the heart of what Hess's law is all about. Hess's law tells us that the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the pathway of that reaction. So using enthalpy changes of formation and enthalpy changes of combustion were two different pathways, and yet they both led to the same overall answer. And that has to be the case, because if it wasn't, energy wouldn't be conserved. Example two, use standard enthalpy changes of combustion to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction for this equation here. So I'm going to put a little star next to what I'm finding out. Um, so what we've got here is this stuff here is ethanol and this is ethanoic acid. And they're reacting together to make this here, which is ethyl ethanoate and some water. OK, now our first step is to ensure the equation balances. I can promise you it does, but you can check that for yourself if you need to. Um, then we're going to write the combustion products beneath. So if we look over on the left, um, both of these things are going to burn to make carbon dioxide and water. So we're going to have um, CO2 add H2O. The only question now really is how many of each? Well, we've got two carbons here, uh, two carbons there, and uh, three carbons, four carbons. So four carbons in total will make four carbon dioxides. And then in terms of the waters, we've got five hydrogens, six, seven eight nine seven eight nine there and ten so that's going to make five waters and if we check on the left that would produce the same as well okay so those are our combustion products four carbon dioxides and five waters um, then we're going to add arrows uh, connecting the elements to each side of the equation now remember because we're talking about enthalpies of combustion here um, we're burning our reactants and products, the arrows are going to go downwards. 
And that's a really key step because that makes sure that we're going to get our final calculation the right way round. OK, so I've added my arrows. The next thing I'm going to do is find my delta H, uh, my enthalpy change of combustion. Um, so I can find my delta H's for each side. So a delta H1 is going to be the enthalpy change of combustion for ethanol, C2H5OH, added to my enthalpy change of combustion for um, ethanoic acid, C2, oh, sorry, um, CH3COOH. So if I look in my data booklet, the values for those are going to be um, ethanol is minus uh, is minus 1,367, and for ethanoic acid, my value is minus 874. And if I add those together, I'm going to get uh, 1367 and 874. Add those together, I get minus 2241 as my value for delta H1. Now with delta H2, I am only going to be adding or only going to be working or finding my enthalpy change of combustion for the ethyl ethanoate here. I could ignore the water because water doesn't burn, so it doesn't have an enthalpy change of combustion. So this is going to be the delta HC of um, CH3COOC2H5. Okay, And if I look that up in the data booklet, um, ethyl ethanoate is minus 2,238. So minus 2,238. So I've got delta H1 and I've got delta H2. So my last step then is to calculate delta HR by subtracting as I go against the arrow and adding as I go with the arrow. So delta HR is going to equal, I go with the first arrow, so that's going to be delta H1, and I'm going against the second arrow. So that's going to be take away delta H2. And if I do that, that is minus 2,241 take away minus 2238 and that gives me a really small value as an answer of minus three kilojoules per mole now that is a very very small enthalpy change of reaction and in fact what we find with this reaction is this reaction is an equilibrium and the products can turn back into the reactants and part of the reason they can do that is because this enthalpy change of reaction is so small that it doesn't cost much energy for the products to turn back into the reactants. So lastly we've got example three again we're going to calculate the delta HR using enthalpy changes of combustion and it's for a reaction that we've seen before it's the same example three as with the enthalpy changes of formation so it's um, hexane C6H14 making three um, uh, ethenes, C2H4, and some hydrogen. Okay, so uh, ensure the equation balances, it does. So that's the first step done. Next step is to write the combustion products in. So if I've got six carbons, that's going to make um, six carbon dioxides when it burns. And if I've got 14 hydrogens, that's going to make seven waters when it burns. And the products on the right would also produce the same combustion products okay so I'm going to add my arrows in now and my arrows are going from the things at the top down to the combustion products because that's what enthalpies of combustion are doing there the enthalpy change when you make those combustion products so the arrows are pointing downwards okay so now we're going to find our delta HRs um, so our delta H1 and delta H2 so delta H1 is just going to be the standard enthalpy change of combustion for hexane C6H14 and if I look on table 13 of the data booklet hexane has a standard enthalpy change of formation of minus 4163 kilojoules per mole so that's delta H1 done nice and easy delta H2 a little bit harder uh, because with delta H2 we've got three ethenes so we need three lots of its enthalpy change of combustion so we're going to do 3 times delta HC of C2H4. And also, remember, although hydrogen is an element, 
we can't ignore it because it does burn. So we've got to add its um, enthalpy change of combustion as well. So delta HC of H2 as well. Okay. So if I find these values from the data booklet, I'm going to have three times for ethene. Um, the enthalpy change of combustion for ethene is minus 1,411. So three times minus 1,411. And I'm going to add on the enthalpy change of combustion for hydrogen, which is minus 286 kilojoules per mole. And so if I do that, um, so three times 1411 and 286 that's going to give me minus 4519 kilojoules per mole for delta h2 okay so now i've done that fifth step my last step is to calculate delta hr adding as we go with the arrows subtracting as we go against so delta hr is going to equal delta h1 because we're going with the arrow take away delta h2 because we're going against the arrow so take away delta h2 so this will be minus 4163 take away minus 4519 and if i do that let me just quickly type it in so 4163 minus take away 4519 minus and that gives me plus 356 kilojoules per mole. So I think the key things to get in this one right were just to remember to multiply the um, ethene by three because we've got the three in the equation. And also remembering not to ignore the hydrogen. We only ignore elements when we're talking, when we're using enthalpy changes of formation. Similar to example one, Example three was also one that we did using enthalpy changes of formation. And wouldn't you know, whether we use enthalpy changes of combustion or whether we choose enthalpy changes of formation, we get the same answer again. And this is again, it's another illustration of Hess's law, because the whole point of Hess's law is that it doesn't matter the path you take to do your calculation. All that matters is that the reactants and products are the same. And if they are, you should get the same answer, which you can see here that we have again, clearly demonstrating that conservation of energy. Now, bond enthalpies. Um, this is going to lead us into our last type of calculations that we're going to do using the idea of Hess's law. Now, a bond enthalpy is the enthalpy change when one mole of a covalent bond is converted to gaseous atoms. OK, so if you think about that, then by definition, these are going to be endothermic. And the reason for that is that you have to put energy into a bond to break it. You're physically having to pull two atoms apart and that requires energy. So all of them are endothermic. Now you can find the um, all of the bond enthalpies you need on uh, section uh, or table 11 of the data booklets. And you'll see there, you've got this big grid representing all of the different uh, single bond enthalpies. And then also you've got a few different multiple bond enthalpies written below it. And if we look at some values, you know, for example, the hydrogen, hydrogen single bond has an enthalpy, uh, bond enthalpy of 436 kilojoules per mole. The carbon carbon one is 346 kilojoules per mole. So that is weaker than the hydrogen hydrogen bond. The carbon oxygen double bond is 804 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot more than either of the other two, but we should expect that because it's a double bond. So it should be stronger than a single bond. Okay, now we are going to be calculating enthalpy changes um, using these in a second, but it's worth remembering that we will get, or worth noting rather, we'll get different answers than if we'd used enthalpy changes of combustion and enthalpy changes of formation. That's not because Hess's law isn't really true, but it's because these bond enthalpies are average bond enthalpies. So what that means is in the average compound, the average carbon carbon bond has a strength of 346 kilojoules per mole, but that's only an average. In some compounds, it's a bit more. In some compounds, it's a bit less. And the effect of those, those the difference between those averages and the actual real life bond strengths in the specific compounds we use means that the answers we get will vary. That doesn't mean that uh, Hess's law is broken. It just means that bond enthalpies are an imperfect way of doing these calculations.
Okay then, so how do we actually use these bond enthalpies to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction? Let's look at example one. Again, we're finding delta H and R, so I'm going to put a little star next to that. Um, let's look at a, a, an overall approach similar to what we did before. So we're going to ensure the equation balances. Um, then we're going to write the atoms beneath rather than elements in their standard states. We're going to add down arrows um, connecting the elements to each side of the equation. Then we're going to count the numbers of each bond on each side. Then we'll find and add up all of the bond enthalpies uh, involved in doing that. And then we're going to calculate uh, delta HR once we've done that in a similar way to what we've done before. Now, I'm not going to um, hand write everything this time because it's going to get very complicated because um, there'll be an awful lot on the screen. So um, I will just do it via the magic of animations instead. So. The first thing we're going to do then is ensure the equation balances. It does, so I'm just going to tick that bit off. Then we're going to write the atoms beneath, and that will look like this. So what we can see is that in this reaction, we're going to have two carbons uh, and six hydrogens, both in their gaseous state, because that's what you form when you break bonds, is atoms in their gaseous state. So that's that step there done. Then we're going to add down arrows, connecting the elements to each side of the equation. Um, so that's going to look something like this. Why do those arrows go down? Because when we're breaking bonds, we're turning these substances up here into individual atomized elements uh, down there. So the arrows are going down towards the individual atoms. Now, the next bit, this is the hard step. We're going to have to count the numbers of each bond on each side of the equation. And really to do this, um, we're going to need diagrams, uh, full displayed formulas for each of our different substances. So our ethene, for example, looks like this with a carbon-carbon double bond and four carbon-hydrogen single bonds. Hydrogen looks like this, just one hydrogen-hydrogen single bond. And then our ethane looks like this. So often in an exam question, you'll be given those diagrams. Uh, although those displayed formulas, sometimes, particularly if they're more simple compounds, you may be expected to draw them yourself. But it's very hard to do this if you don't have some diagrams to work from. So now we've got those diagrams. What we can do is count the number of um, uh, bonds on uh, each side of the equation. So if we if we do delta H1 first, then we can do delta H2 after that. So on that left side of the equation, we've got one carbon carbon double bond, four carbon hydrogen single bonds and one hydrogen hydrogen single bond and so if we find the values for each of those from table 11 in the data booklet we get this 614 for the carbon carbon double four lots of 414 for the carbon hydrogen single and 436 for the hydrogen hydrogen single and add all those together and we get a total bond enthalpy on the left of our uh, equation of 2,706 kilojoules per mole. So again, let's do the same thing on the right hand side. A bit simpler this one because we've only got two types of bond. So what we'll find is delta H2 is going to involve one carbon carbon single bond and six carbon hydrogen single bonds. Find the values on table 11 of the data booklet. We get 346 as our value for the carbon carbon single and six lots of 414 for the carbon hydrogen single and that adds up to give me 2830 kilojoules per mole so now i've done this step here i've done the counting the numbers of each bond on each side and i found and added up all of the bond enthalpies on each side as well so all that's left now is to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction in the same way as before adding as we go with the arrows subtracting as we go against them and that would look like this so we'd have delta h1 uh, so uh, delta hr is delta h1 because we're going with the arrow take away delta h2 as we go against the arrow so delta h1 take delta h2 which gives me 2706 minus 2830 which comes to minus 124 kilojoules per mole now we've seen this equation before We've we've done it. Uh, we've we've done this calculation both with enthalpy changes of combustion and enthalpy changes of formation. And look, when we did it with enthalpy changes of combustion, and enthalpy changes of formation, we got minus 136 kilojoules per mole. And this time, we've got minus 124 kilojoules per mole. And hold on a second, you must be thinking, 
shouldn't Hess's law always give us the same answer? Well, yes, in an ideal world it should. However, we've got to remember that we've been using bond enthalpies. And bond enthalpies are by definition an average for those kind of bonds in a massive range of different compounds. They don't give us the exact strength of each bond in the exact compounds we've got. And so this quite big difference between 124 and 136 kilojoules per mole can be explained by the fact that the bond enthalpies we're using are averages and so they aren't exactly the right ones in this particular set of compounds we're using in this calculation. So it's not that Hess's law is broken, this is a result of the very nature of what these average bond enthalpies are. Right, example two, use average bond enthalpies to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction for this reaction here. So I put a little star next to what I'm trying to find out. Um, now, we've seen this one uh, before as well. We calculated this using enthalpy changes of combustion before. So it'll be interesting to see how this value using bond enthalpies compares to the previous value using enthalpy changes of combustion. So again, I'm not going to um, not going to write everything by hand this time because it would just get too busy and too crowded. Uh, so we'll, we'll use the magic of animations again. Um, first of all, we're going to ensure the equation balances. It does, but you can check if you want. Um, then we're going to write the atoms beneath. So that's going to look something like this. So we're going to have four carbons, 10 hydrogens and three oxygens. I'm putting a G for gas for all of them because when we're using bond enthalpies, we're breaking bonds to make gaseous atoms. So that is step two done. Um, step three then is to add down arrows connecting the elements to each side of the equation. And remember again, the arrows are going down because we're turning our reactants and products into atoms and because we're breaking all of their bonds. So the arrows go down. So that's that done. Then we're going to count the number of each bond on each side. Now to do that, we are going to need uh, displayed formulas for each one, which is these diagrams here. As I said before, you will probably be provided with these in the exam, but for simple ones, you may be expected to draw them yourself. Now, now we then need to count the number of each type of bond on each side of the equation and then find and add up all of the bond enthalpies on each side of the equation. So let's have a look at that. We'll start with the left side, delta H1. So our bond enthalpies are going to be as follows. Two carbon-carbon single bonds. Eight carbon hydrogens single bonds, two carbon oxygen single bonds, one carbon oxygen double bond, and two oxygen hydrogen single bonds. Now, if I turn to section 11 of the data booklet, I can find that the values for that are as follows. So 346 for the carbon carbon single, 800 and, so 414 for the carbon hydrogen single, 358 for carbon oxygen single, 804 for the, uh, for the carbon oxygen double and 463 for the um, uh, oxygen hydrogen single bond. And if I multiply those together and add them all up, we get 6,450 kilojoules per mole for delta H1. So let's do the same thing on the right hand side. So I will have two carbon carbon singles, eight carbon hydrogen singles, two carbon oxygen singles, one carbon oxygen double and two oxygen hydrogen singles. And again, find the data from section 11 of the data booklet. That's going to give me two lots of 346, eight lots of 414, two lots of 358, 804 and two lots of 436. And if I do that, it comes to 6,450. So I've done these two steps. I've counted the numbers of bonds on each side and found and added up all of their bond enthalpies using the data on table 11. So the last thing is to do my delta HR calculation down here by subtracting as I go against the arrows, adding as I go with them. So that will look like this. Um, delta HR is going to equal delta H1 because we're going with the arrow. Take away delta H2 because we're going against the arrow. So that is going to be... 6,450 for delta H1, take away 6,450 for delta H2 to give me zero kilojoules per mole. Well, how can that be? How can it be zero? Well, you may have already noticed, if you're really paying attention, that we've got the exact same numbers of each type of bond on each side of the equation. So 
we should expect it to be zero because all of the bonds on the left get cancelled out by all of the bonds on the right, leaving us with an overall uh, change of zero. Now, this does lead us to a second potential way you can do these calculations. Um, before you get as far as this step here and this step here where you're adding up all of your bonds, you can cancel out ones that appear on both the left and the right. So, you know, there's two carbon carbons on the left, two carbon carbons on the right, so I can cancel those out. I've got eight carbon hydrogens on the left, eight on the right, so they cancel out and so on. Now, now if you work this through, it does lead to a simpler cal uh, calculation. However, there is a danger that you do your cancelling wrong and you make a mistake and then your whole answer ends up wrong. So I would only advise you to, to follow that kind of approach if you're really confident with these calculations. OK, so the last uh, thing I want to do is to see how does this value calculated using bond enthalpies, how does that compare to the value we previously calculated using enthalpy changes of combustion? And as you'll see, with enthalpy changes of combustion, it was minus three kilojoules per mole. Um, and that is pretty close, isn't it, to the zero we've just calculated using bond enthalpies, but it is different. And importantly, the minus three value, this is the more accurate one. And the reason that's the more accurate one is because the value you calculated using bond enthalpies is only ever approximate because these are average bond enthalpies and don't necessarily reflect the exact enthalpy of each of the bonds in these particular compounds. So now on to our last example. Again, we're going to calculate delta HR using bond enthalpies. And it will be for this reaction that we've seen before, where we're converting hexane C6H14 into three ethene C2H4 and hydrogen H2. We use the same approach as last time. So we're going to ensure the equation balances, uh, which it does. Then we're going to write the atoms beneath. Um, so that's going to be six carbons and 14 hydrogens. Um, and we're writing them as gaseous atoms because when you break uh, covalent bonds, you form gaseous atoms. And then we add on our arrows. Remember, the arrows are pointing downwards because when we break a bond, which is what bond enthalpies are all about, we form the atoms. So we're going to point towards those atoms. Now for the hard bit or the harder bit where we're going to count the numbers of bonds on each side of the equation and then find and add up all their bond enthalpies. So we're going to start with our displayed formulas so we can see all of the bonds. So for hexane, our displayed formula is this um, six carbons. Uh, bonded to each other with hydrogens arranged there, around the outside. Then we've got our ethene like this and our hydrogen like this. Now, we're going to have to bear in mind that with this one, because we've got three ethenes, you know, for example, we're not going to have just one carbon-carbon double bond, but three of them. We won't have four carbon-hydrogen bonds, but 12 of them. So we'll come on to that when we look at delta H2 in a bit more detail. So let's get the easier one done first, delta H1. So delta H1 is going to be five carbon carbon single bonds and 14 carbon hydrogen single bonds and if we look in section 11 of our data booklets we can see that that would be five lots of 346 and four lots of 414 which would come to a total of 7256 kilojoules per mole for delta h1 so with delta h2 Remember, we're going to have to think about that stoichiometry up here. That three is going to interfere with things a little bit. So what would that look like in practice? We will have three carbon-carbon double bonds because we've got three ethenes and 12 carbon-hydrogen single bonds because we've got three ethenes. And then there's still that one hydrogen-hydrogen single bond as well. So again, researching my values from table 11, we're going to have three lots of 614 added to 12 lots of 414 and one lot of 436. And that would give me a total of 7,246 kilojoules per mole. So that's these two steps done. I've counted the numbers of bonds on each side and found and added up their bond enthalpies. So finally, we're gonna calculate our delta HR using our um, idea that we add as we go with the arrows and we subtract as we go against. So this is going to be delta H1 take away delta H2 because we're going against that delta H2 arrow, which is going to give us 7,526 take away 7,246. And that will give us a value 
of 280 kilojoules per mole as our final answer. And remember, it's just worth comparing that to the values we got before. Now, when we did this with enthalpy changes of combustion and formation, we got a value of 356 kilojoules per mole compared to 280 kilojoules per mole with bond enthalpies. Now, remember, this value, the one from the enthalpy changes of formation and combustion, that is our accurate one. And the reason why that's the accurate one is because the 280 that we've just calculated is using average bond enthalpies, which are not necessarily accurate for the specific compounds that we are using in one of these calculations. So that's it. This is the end of this presentation. So well done if you got this far. Um, if you didn't fully understand everything, just give it another little uh, re uh, rewatch, re-listen. Um, perhaps try and do each of the calculations before you actually then listen to my annotations. Um, and no matter how confident you're feeling about this now, make sure you find um, questions to practice yourself because you, you'll, you'll find examples of these all over the internet. So thank you for listening and well done. Good night. <laughs>